Well, ladies and gentlemen, our next session is going to be vascular medicine. The moderator, Dr. Don Brown. Don Brown is the director of medical education at the medical center. I have known him since 2002. Dr. Brown has been instrumental in bringing academics to our institution. The so-called Community Hospital of Bowling Green for the last 75 years, the medical center is now transformed into an academic institution. We have now Intel Medicine Residency Program and about to embark Cardiovascular Fellowship Program in 2016. This would not have happened without Dr. Brown's efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, please, in, please welcome Dr. Don Brown. And psychiatry, we're gonna have psychiatry too, yeah. I'm going to introduce the panelists. Um, Dr. Shane O'Keefe is uh, my partner, been my partner for about four years uh, at the Heart Institute, and he comes from UK and he's uh, from England. I mean, Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Dr. Singh is the. Uh, is the Department of Prevention, Cardiology, and Vascular Medicine at Western Kentucky uh, Heart and Lung, and he is board cert uh, certified in vascular medicine, so we'll uh, give him a hand as well. Will you give both of these a hand? <laughs> Dr. Dr. Byrne was supposed, supposed to be here today, but he is on call, and he has been flooded and had an emergency, and he sends his apologies that he's not here today. So I would like to introduce Dr. Bruce Gray, to the podium. Um, Dr. We're very honored to have him. He did his internship and residency in Ohio. He did his uh, fellowship, his vascular medicine fellowship and his endovascular medicine fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic uh, Foundation in Cleveland. He is, uh, has a current academic appointment as a professor of surgery and vascular medicine at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine uh, in Greenville, South Carolina. He's, he's had that appointment since 2004. He is an adjunct professor of bioengineering at the College of Engineering and Science in Clemson. They do a lot of research. He is on the editorial board for the Annals of Vascular Surgery, Endovascular Today, Catheterization and Cardiovascular Intervention, and uh, Vascular Medicine. He is also the reviewer for several journals to include Vascular Medicine, Annals of Vascular Surgery, Circulation, uh, Journal of Endovascular Therapy, Catheterization, Cardiovascular Intervention, Journal of American College of Cardiology uh, Interventions and something else there. Um, <laughs> this is big. He, he's the president of the American Board of Vascular Medicine. He actually create, helped create this board of vascular medicine. And he's the co-chairman of the Peripheral Disease Committee for Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention. Um, he has well published. He's done uh, multiple, multiple national lectures, and he's done that for me actually on uh, on a conference that I moderated a few years ago. So we're very pleased to have him. Would you give him a hand, please? Thank you very much, Don and uh, organizers. Uh, I've been very privileged to come, and it's my privilege to share some patient care issues with you. I'll tell you, I only got one slide that has p-values on it. So this is, um, if you could drop the lights just a little bit in front uh, too, these are very, this is a very uh, um, clinically oriented uh, study, or excuse me, talk, and um, I, I should mention my conflicts of interest. I don't take any money from companies, but I do talk with a lot of them, and we interact quite regularly, but all honoraria or uh, any fees uh, do not come to me. Unfortunately, uh, this is two slides, my, my four kids, and then, and then I was going to show you the slide with the redwood with the kids in, uh, inside the redwood tree, suggesting that a lot of what we see in vascular medicine needs this kind of perspective. What your eye initially picks up, you need to step back and look at the whole picture and interpret the history, the physical examination, any lab, and the differential diagnosis in the context of the big picture. Just a side story about redwoods. You know, they can grow about 300, 350 feet tall. Their root system only goes down about 12 feet, yet it goes out about 150 feet. 
No redwood stands alone. They all stand together because the root system is intermingled. They last usually in the valley so that they aren't as susceptible to the wind. And those are the ones that really grow up big, but usually it's their root system that is kind of unknown. You think 350 feet tall, but yet the root system only goes down about 12 feet. Quite significant in how it absorbs water and then, then they stand together. That's really what I'm standing on here to talk about this is uh, the mentors in which um, uh, have fed into me and, and how I think. So I want to share some of what's been fed into me. And so I looked at my practice uh, just over the last two years out of curiosity and I wanted to look at what I'd seen in, in patients that were young, over 30 years and or under, under 30 years of age. And this was a consecutive series of patients and I'd say most of them are in the 10 to 20 year uh, age range or 20 to 30 age range. Very few are under 10 years of age. So just a spectrum of disease, uh, age range. Uh, most of the uh, patients, I'd say a quarter of them had vasospastic diseases, some with venous uh, thrombosis, very few with uh, superficial vein problems, but it really covered the gamut of vascular medicine. And these are the 24 patients that I want to share with you. First patient, 30-year-old, she complains of a, a noise in her neck. Uh, and she's been described as having a brewery, but she also has hypertension, has some thyroid disease. And the ultrasound was done, and the ultrasound was read out as having approximately 50% stenosis on the right and 50 to 69% stenosis on the left. However, that was based off flow criteria. However, when you look at the ultrasound, there's really no plaque in these arteries at all, but yet that's the way it was interpreted. What do you think about 30-year-old with a one-year history of noise in the neck? Usually occurs during activity. Well, you need to look at the patient. You put your stethoscope on the base of the neck on the side and you hear this sound that goes woo, 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 woo. Then you put your finger right above it and it compress the jugular vein and the noise goes away. Diagnosis, venous hum. Very common in women. Always hurt at the base of the right neck for the most part because the jugular and the subclavian vein come together at that confluence and cause this hum. Woo, woo, woo. Whereas the systolic brewery that you'll hear at the bulb is ch, ch, ch. If you hear, ever hear a brewery that sounds like this, ch, 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 where you get that diastolic taper uh, um, late, that's always associated with a severe arterial stenosis below your stethoscope, and two thirds have a contralateral ICA occlusion. It's very helpful. Physical examination makes a difference. Now, then you get a 27-year-old that comes in with episodic pain in the left side of the neck. And when you push her, she says, right on my carotid artery. It's right here. My carotid artery hurts me. And it really hurts me. I've had it four times over the last two years. And this is a quadruple A personality because she takes care of uh, kids. She takes care of her own kids. And she worries about it. She's a high-stress type of individual. She's been treated with antibiotics. She's been treated with steroids. But She's been treated with a lot of things. What do you think about when you're given an ultrasound that doesn't have anything and uh, a diagnosis is not made? She's still worried about what's going on. I don't want to have a stroke. My carotid artery hurts. Well, there's a differential diagnosis to pain in the carotid artery, which includes everything from aneurysm, carotid body tumor, dissection, acute occlusion, vasculitis, fibromuscular dysplasia, carotidinia. How do you make the diagnosis? Well. Most all probably should have just a simple duplex ultrasound to make sure there isn't a dissection for somebody that has severe carotid pain. And a duplex was done to show tortuosity of the left internal carotid artery, but no plaque, nothing else. An MR was done for other reasons I'll explain later in regards to looking at the patient. And, and MR-wise, everything looked normal. What do you think about? What's the diagnosis? I can give you that differential diagnosis again. So this is most consistent with carotidinia, pain in the carotid artery. It's episodic, usually lasts for two weeks and goes away. It doesn't matter what you give them, it's going to go away. I actually have it. When I get all stressed out, I actually get this uh, pain in the carotid artery. It um, it's hurts. It's very tender. And uh, 
there are some medications that are used for it, but for the most part, just reassurance, and it's, and it's not going to be a recurrent problem. However, on duplex ultrasound, when you see tortuosity uh, in the carotid artery, it's been associated with fibromuscular dysplasia. And if you make the diagnosis of fibromuscular dysplasia, then you must rule out the associated uh, problem of intracranial aneurysm, which uh, in the registry is about 15% have intracranial aneurysmal disease. So the reason why an MR was done on that uh, patient early was to rule out aneurysmal disease that could be associated with fibromuscular dysplasia and carotid artery tortuosity. You see an S-shaped curve in a young person? That's what you think about. However, what happens when you see artery stenosis in this 23-year-old complaining of a carotid brewery and that's got that arterial sound, that ch, ch, ch. Also, you hear it over the clavicle. Now, do you know how to differentiate a carotid brewery from a subclavian brewery? Well, carotid brewery you hear over the carotid artery and subclavian brewery you hear over the subclavian artery, which is just above the clavicle. If you hear it in both positions, you can put your thumb and compress off the subclavian artery. If the noise goes away in the neck, then you know the brewery has come from only the subclavian artery. So you can sort out the, the difference. This one clearly had a subclavian artery brewery and a subclavian artery stenosis. Also had some aortic disease. Diagnosis? Takiasus, very good, very good. Um, in the, I want to give you this, this list here. When you're not sure, it's okay not to know, because a lot of things we walk into, we don't know. All right, so where do you start to think about a differential diagnostic list when you don't know to begin with? Well, just start here. When you see ischemia, any ischemia, it doesn't matter what territory it is, think thrombus or embolus. And there's four categories of things that embolize. Everything from aneurysm, atherosclerosis, things from the heart. Lots of things from the heart can embolize or paradoxical. Venous side clot comes up the heart, see, goes through a patent uh, atrial septal defect, gets over into the arterial side. Five categorical things that thrombose, aneurysms, atherosclerosis, thrombophilic patients, trauma, and vasculitis. So if you don't know, this is a great place to start. Just start down the list. So you get, see this patient? Not sure, go to that list. It'll, it'll uh, jog that thought process a way to at least get started. So then you see this 15-year-old. He's a soccer player. He's in high school. He wants to play soccer, and he gets out on the field, and he can get about 10 minutes into the first half, and then he, he's limping around, and he can't move. And the ultrasound was done because it did sound like he had intermittent claudication, but as you know, in a 15-year-old, that's most unusual. Most unusual, and the ultrasound confirms there is a left popliteal artery occlusion with a diminished ankle breaker index of 0.5. What's the differential diagnosis of popliteal artery disease in the young? Anything from entrapment syndrome where the muscle compresses off the artery. When the muscle contracts, it compresses off the artery, and ultimately it thrombose. Cystic adventitial disease is very uncommon. It's a cyst that occurs actually in the uh, adventitial layer of the popliteal artery and it compresses off the lumen. Trauma, most commonly seen with posterior dislocation of the knee or spontaneous dissection. Here, uh, MR was done. There's no separation between the artery and vein, which three of the five forms of popliteal entrapment, usually you see separation of that. So on the MR, what are you looking for? You're looking for separation between the artery and vein by a muscle slip or something. Sometimes the gastrocnevius muscle is developmentally put between the artery and vein, and that's, what's, that's what you pick up on the MR. Or sometimes you can see the cyst, but if the MR's normal, doesn't mean you've successfully ruled these out. Okay, how about pain in the finger? Do you see what the nail plate looks like on this? I'm not sure you can see it in the back, but it's, the nail plate's very significant. You, these are splinter hemorrhages on the end of the finger at the end of the nail. Splinter hemorrhages, very classic. When you hear splinter hemorrhages, the textbook answer is SBE. That's the textbook answer. The vascular medicine answer is ischemia. Any ischemia can give it to you. Any ischemia can give it to you. So you go back to the list. Because any ischemia can give you splinter hemorrhages. This is only seen in the index finger. And you got a little sore on the end of the index finger. What do you think about? 
Well, there are some specific things that lead to ischemia in the hand that broaden that differential diagnosis. Hypothene or hammer syndrome where you're pounding back hubcaps onto the cars on a regular basis. You beat up your ulnar artery right at the base of the hand. You develop perhaps a little aneurysm there that shoots off little debris into the fingers and so you can get finger ischemia that way. You can get entrapment uh, uh, of the radial artery by the extensor pollicis longus ligament. So there's some specific differential diagnoses depending on what distribution you have. This patient actually had uh, the uh, entrapment by the extensor pollicis longus. Uh, region of interest was a radial artery uh, distribution. That's what that patient had. How, uh, how about color change? This is classic, right? You see that? I bet most all of you would put the name Raynaud's to it. Very good. Very good. It usually occurs in the hands over the feet, right? Upper extremity, it's induced by cold and stress, things that bring it on. How many get it due to coffee, caffeine, goodie powders, ADD, ADHD medication? Uh, there's a lot of things that have brought in the list of things that induce this in our young patients. There are primary and secondary forms. Usually you don't have to work them up for secondary forms if they just got the typical distribution of, of a disease. You don't usually need to look at them, but physical exam should help you rule out thoracic outlet syndrome. Your history ought to tell you just about everything else, and don't be afraid to ask them about dope and cocaine and all this other junk that people are taking uh, that sometimes uh, changes their physical exam findings. But what happens when the redness is all that they get and they don't get the white and blue like you do the classic tricolor phasic look of Raynaud's is white, blue, red. The white and blue is the vasoconstricted part. The red is the vasodilatory phase. That's just what happens in a migraine too. You knew that. That pain of migraine is when the blood vessels are vasodilated. So not infrequently, Raynaud's patients have migraine headaches. And then the treatment that you give them for their hands and feet sometimes exacerbate the migraines. So uh, keep that in mind. But what happens when you just get red hands and red feet? Diagnosis? Good. Acrocyanosis. Acrocyanosis is this a symmetric, ruddy, ruddy blue color, and the color usually comes up past the joint. That's one of the, that's one of the hallmark features. If it's on the sole of the foot, it comes up. It's kind of up to the ankle. If it's on the hands, it usually comes up to the wrist. It's different. Raynaud's, as you know, affects the distal vasculature more significantly than the whole hand or the whole foot, right? So acrocyanosis. What's the most common associated condition in somebody that presents with acrocyanosis? That's a board question for those that are going to take the board in vascular medicine. It's anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa, these people, they become very sensitive and not infrequently they present with acrocyanosis. The treatment for acrocyanosis? Treat the anorexia, right? and try to keep them off of medications if you can. And the easy thing for you to do at the bedside, lift up their feet, they're red. They're, it's a persistent redness with dependency and all you have to do is lift them up and the redness goes away. All right, easy, easy bedside clinical diagnosis. Is this helpful? All right, let's keep going. What happens when the redness and you elevate it, it doesn't go away? What's that? Perfect, how'd you know that? What's your eye tell you? Your eye told you something in that regard. It's usually splotchy. It's not confluent. The erythema of chronic venous insufficiency is always confluent, always distal. This is proximal. It's non-confluent, and it doesn't change with elevation. And patients are usually sick. If they got this much erythema, they're sick. So you're not going to miss this diagnosis. But the most conflicting one is patients get diagnosed with cellulitis of the lower leg. They got cranionic venous insufficiency, and the erythema that they got goes right away as soon as you elevate their leg. How do you tell the difference? Elevate them up. Put your hand on them. Although the leg may feel warm with venous insufficiency, 
more, probably not quite as hot as it will with cellulitis. All right. Um, this should have a little video play with it, and when you rub your finger over it, it blanches. What blanches? What blanches? When blood's in a blood vessel, it blanches. When blood's outside of a, a blood vessel, it doesn't blanch. All right, simple. All right, so this blanches. What's this patient got? All right, sometimes I review the same stuff, this acrocinosis. All right, that's the ruddy, ready blue stuff of acrocinosis. All right, ruddy, ready blue. Dependent, it blanches. Goes away with, goes away with elevation. And bruises, as you know, what's the, what's the uh, term used for when you see a bruise underneath the medial malleolus? It's a, it's a scimitar sign. It looks like a saber sword. Scimitar sign. Scimitar sign usually means some blood has come from upstream and gotten down into the ankle. In those that haven't just sprained their ankle, they've torn a gastroc muscle. They've 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 uh, had some type of muscle disruption. The classic history of someone: I just climbed the ladder. I had this pain in my calf, and then they come in. They got this scimitar sign. And you're doing a venous duplex scan, looking for a DVT, right? I've actually seen people with gastrocnemius muscle tear and a scimitar sign have an abnormal venous duplex that was called the hematoma that was seen in the calf was called a calf DVT and they get anticoagulated and the calf actually gets worse. So easy, easy history, easy physical examination finding and it doesn't blanch, right? What happens when the ruddy, ready blue is on the bottom of the feet and it's painful because acrocyanosis is not painful. What happens when it's, they're complaining of heat? My feet are so hot, I dunk them in ice buckets. I can't sleep with the covers over my feet. Diagnosis? <laughs> Keep going. Erythromyalgia. Red, hot, painful feet. <laughs> yeah. It is. There's a primary and secondary form. It's extremely, extremely difficult to treat. It really is. And these people are miserable, absolutely miserable. And they're, they're fiery red and these feet are hot. You want to look at their platelet count. You do want to work them up for a secondary cause because if you can treat that, it'll help. They ought not infrequently have a neuropathy with it. Erythromyalgia. However, what happens when it's a splotchy look on the toes and it's seasonal and the toes have this light bulb look? You ever seen light bulb toes? You'll see it in this. I saw them in Ohio. I even see them in South Carolina. Comes in the winter, it goes away. Comes back the next winter. They're painful. Sometimes they get little painful sores on the ends of the toes. Diagnosis? Pernio, chilblains disease. Almost everybody with pernio looks the same. You ever see light bulb toes? You got a diagnosis. Pernio, chillblains disease. They get these little stellate sores on the ends of their toes. Put them on medication for the winter months, take them off for the summer months. Tell them it's going to recur. Look for that seasonal history that happened last winter, just not quite as bad. Now I'm coming in complaining because it came back. That's the typical history of pernio and light bulb toes. What if the splotchiness is on the skin? Perfect. What happens when the rings of Livido are inconsistent and you don't have good rings of Livido? They're broken rings. There's a difference. That's the difference between primary and secondary form of Livido. So sometimes you want to look for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in those that have the funny look of Livido on their legs. So we all see Livido, and you see it Livido in these people that have, you see Livido in these people that have Raynaud's and all this other stuff. So they, there's overlap. There's overlap with these syndromes a lot, just like migraine is an overlap for almost all of these vasospastic disorders. What happens when you get a little Livido type of look just in a very isolated spot like this on the back of the calf? You'll sometimes see it on the anterior thigh, too, in people that put their computer on their thigh and work with their computer on their thighs for long periods of time. 
Diagnosis? Perfect. Who knew that? Stand up, man. That was awesome. <laughs> For those that didn't hear the right answer, erythema ob igni. Erythema ob igni. That's right. You can read. It's perfect. It's perfect. Erythema ob igni. It's very interesting. It's heat induced. So this guy actually put a heating pad on his calf because he hurt his calf. <laughs> He's wearing this heating pad on a regular, uh, using the heating pad on a regular basis and then get, gets this color change. It's not atheroembolization, which is sometimes what you think about because that may be a more common scenario that you may see in your atherosclerotic population, but where you're looking at young people, you don't think atherosclerosis. Now, when somebody comes in with vasospastic type symptomatology, I almost always think of these five things, so, and I'm going to review them just quite quite briefly. Erythromalgias of the feet, rhinosis of the hands over the feet, pernio is feet over hands, acrocyanosis is common in anorexic patients, and livido is that uh, lacy appearance. Sometimes they don't pigeonhole into any one of these perfectly, but they got a little overlap. And it's kind of nice just to review them all always whenever you see somebody with Raynaud's. You think about all these other things as well because they have overlap. Now, this patient has what? What's the diagnosis that you see in the feet? Sometimes I review the same disease, disorder. Very good. Acrocinosis. And sometimes they're really skinny. This one also has Marfan's. So sometimes, like that, my kid sitting in front of the redwood tree, you want to step back and look at the whole picture, right? Don't miss the whole picture. Because I know that one. I know that. I jump into feet. And I bet next one that comes in with acrocyanosis, you're going to get it, because I beat you with it today. But we want to step back, and we want to make sure we look at the whole patient and not miss Marfan's that's sitting right in front of us. Okay, somebody comes in with a big, ruddy, reddy blue uh, leg, got erythrocyanotic appearance to it, dilated veins, edema, and it's hot to touch. What's the diagnosis? You know it. DVT. First thing you think about. DVT. DVT. Does the textbook, what's the textbook say about physical examination and, and the diagnosis of DVT? That's right. That's what the textbook said. I'm telling you, you knew it just looking at it. Why? Because look for these four cardinal clues. Ruddy, ruddy, blue color, edema, increased skin temperature warmth. More bloods come to the skin to the skin to get out, right? So it's going to be warm and you're going to have dilated veins. Physical examination makes a huge difference when you look at them. When you look at them, you can tell. This one actually gets the label of phlegmasia sorola dolens, right? This one is a phlegmatic leg. This one's bad. This one's really obvious. But physical examination makes a difference in, uh, in vascular disease because our, ours is very, very obvious. Now, what happens when, in the upper extremity when you get a DVT? You also look for the venial pattern right under the deltoid muscle. These venials stand out. And I saw a 13-year-old volleyball player yesterday that, that I, was, I was talking to the fellows about this, and I said, look for the venial pattern. This little volleyball player comes in, and lo and behold, she had all five of them. She had a red, ruddy, ruddy blue arm. This isn't her pictures, but this just happened yesterday, too. She had the venial pattern right under the deltoid. It was warm. She had the dilated veins over her collarbone, uh, and she had upper extremity DVT. So physical examination works in the upper extremity, too, just like it worked in the lower extremity. So in this 13-year-old volleyball player, what's her other associative uh, condition that caused the thoracic outlet? Thoracic outlet. So it's thoracic outlet syndrome in, a, in somebody that does overhead type of things is quite common as an associative condition with upper extremity DVT or Paget-Schroeder syndrome. And how many of them have a thrombophilia associated with it? About 50%. Very high. Very high, very good. So would you look for it in this 13-year-old? I think so. I think so. So they usually have multifactorial etiology for, for clot. I'm getting close to the end. I'll try to speed up. Sorry. Um, how about just swollen toes? Can you see the difference between the toes on the left and the toes on the right? You can recognize lymphedema. You always know lymphedema, right? What's so unique about it? 
what's your eye supposed to pick up? One, no color change. The skin looks the same color, right? No color change. Sausage toes, and you can't pitch the skin of the second toe, the stemmer sign, got a positive stemmer sign. Lymphedema. In an older person, you're thinking of secondary causes. Recurrent severe infections, surgical uh, inc incisions that disrupt the lymphatic channels and tumor. But in the young, you're thinking about primary forms where they just weren't born with enough lymph channels. Um, into some other obvious things on the skin. Hemangiomas in little kids. Uh, realize that most of them resolve. In hemangiomas, you can pick up pretty easily. How about when they got these big, gnarly veins in the foot? There's no port wine stain, there's no leg and foot length discrepancy. The most di likely diagnosis is a venous malformation. Why? Because when in the young, when you have an arterial venous malformation, you almost always get bony overgrowth. You get leg, leg length discrepancy. The foot grows more than the other one does. So you'll get overgrowth in the young if they got an arterial component to it. So that's an important pickup. Here's one that occurred on the, on the back of the arm. This one you could actually hear a brewy in it. Very, very easy to pick up. Just an arterial venous malformation on the, on the arm. All right, that one's easy. This one, this is just a recurrent ulcer. Comes in, he plays soccer. He tries to play soccer, and then my foot hurts me, and this has been going on for a long time. So, and he's, he's a college kid, and he doesn't really um, uh, like to go to the doctor, and he hasn't. So this one, actually, these veins on top of the foot are pulsatile. Arteriographically, he's got multiple connections from his uh, anterior and posterior tibia already into the veins, and, and this is one you just sequentially glue off and then uh, hopefully resolve. The classifications of vascular malformations, we looked at hemangiomas. Vascular malformations can be in the capital arterial venous and lymphatic uh, forms. Really, I think the simple way to do it is, is there arterial involvement or not? And then that helps you kind of differentiate those that are bad actors from those that aren't. And then you get the four-year-old. They got the big swollen leg. Um, you've probably seen this condition because um, it hits the media every now and then with, remember that professional golfer that had clipal trenin A. But the classic triad of clipal trenin A is varicose veins, soft tissue, hemipertrophy, and port wine stain. So there you see port wine stain. Sometimes they get syndactyly. Uh, they got dysgenesis of their deep venous system. Do not inject their lateral limb bud. Sometimes they'll have this big vein coming up the outside part of their leg. Don't inject it because that's how their blood's getting out of their leg. They get dysgenesis not infrequently of the deep system. Clippal trenin A syndrome. What happens when you see it a little different and you see some skeletal malformations as well? What does that look like? This is Cloves syndrome. And there's actually a vascular surgery textbook that uses a picture of a Cloves patient and says they got clippal trenin A. And that's because Cloves has just been recently uh, described in 2007. So even in the midst of your career, sometimes you've got to keep learning because this stuff keeps changing. So this is Cloves syndrome, skeletal malformations. And, um, and they get the port wine stain. They're, they have the, the unusual looking feet. This is a three-year-old with size nine feet. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a disfiguring, but it's the sweetest kid you, you could imagine how sweet, sweet this one is. And then sometimes you see these uh, blue blebs. Uh, this is the blue rubber bleb nevis syndrome. It, it does occur in all over the body and occurs inside as well as outside. But uh, fortunately, kids usually don't, don't have uh, bleeding from their GI tract. Typically, it happens usually in the older one. Three minutes left, so I'll move faster. All right. And then the category of secondary hypertension. How about somebody uh, that presents with severe hypertension in a 22-year-old, what do you think about? If they're very personable, they kind of kind of elfish look to their face, think Williams syndrome. This is Williams syndrome. They got a wide mouth, long upturned nose, Williams syndrome. They can have uh, other things associated with it, but here's the differential diagnosis, secondary hypertension in the young. 
fibromuscular dysplasia, you're used to seeing medial fibromuscular dysplasia, but not intimal fibromuscular dysplasia. Intimal fibromuscular dysplasia is the most frequent subtype in those in the young. In the registry, uh, young kids or young people typically have more renal distribution than carotid uh, distribution of FMD. And then certainly coarctation is another form of secondary hypertension and you want to ask for the history of claudication in these patients as well. So in, in summary, uh, I just wanted to give you a, a very clinically oriented tool chest to emphasize taking a history, using a physical examination, developing a differential diagnosis that just makes sense for that territory, using your lab then to differentiate your differential, not the reverse, and then all the treatments come from there. Once we get the right diagnosis, we'll do everything else well. So thank you very much for your attention. My privilege to be here. All right, thank you, Dr. Gray. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk about something a little bit more common. Help me out. Is that what I do? Okay. So I'm going to talk about aneurysmal disease, and we're going to go real fast because we've got to catch up on some time. Um, this is not my first slide. This is our agenda today. We're going to talk about the overview, the treatment options, um, how we can prevent them and screen them. Uh, an aneurysm is, is generally uh, one and a half times normal uh, diameter of an artery. Uh, generally, uh, an aorta that measures three centimeters, we call an aneurysm. If it's less than three centimeters and it's greater than normal, if it's greater than two centimeters, then we call it ectasia. Um, if you have a thoracic or, uh, artery that's four and a half centimeters, we'll call that an aneurysm. Uh, Popliteal artery is two centimeters. Uh, visceral aneurysms, really, we say two centimeters, that's about when we treat them. You can have a one to one and a half centimeter aneurysm in the visceral arteries that we will leave alone. And generally, um, we, generally we don't ever fix those. Um, if they're calcified, they're generally benign. If you have a young person who's pregnant, we would be very aggressive. Um, but if they get, uh, we, we usually reserve them to be two centimeters before we fix those. Um, the most common etiologies are, are by far and away is atherosclerotic. Uh, syphilitic disease affects the outer two-thirds wall of the artery, uh, affects the vasovasorum. Uh, mycotic aneurysms, that, that term was coined by William Osler. And it sounds fungal, but it's really not. It's, in, it's infected. Infected would be a better, a better term. Um, uh, inherited, there are all kinds of, there, there are several diseases, and I'm not an expert in any of these, but uh, we saw some Marfans, Ehler -Danlo, uh, Danlos, uh, Lois Dietz syndrome, thoracic aortic uh, aneurysmal and dissection syndrome, bicuspid aortic valve disease, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, uh, and, and a few others. All right, all of these famous people had aneurysms. Um, a lot of people have aneurysms. It is the third leading, uh, leading cost, uh, cause of death in men over 60 in the United States. It, uh, often people will not have symptoms until they rupture. Or more likely, a lot of times people will uh, attribute their symptoms to something else, and, and we see that a lot. Uh, more than one million in, uh, in the United States are estimated to have an undiagnosed AAA. I'm not sure how you guess how many people don't, you know, don't know that they have them, but somebody put a number to it. Um, the operative mortality of treating a ruptured aneurysm is somewhere between 30 and 70 percent. It could be higher. I think it's going lower. We're going to talk a little bit uh, more about that. Uh, for an elective AAA case, the operative mortality is, is very low. It says 2 to 7 percent. It's probably lower than that uh, nowadays, especially with uh, endovascular repair. Uh, pathophysiology, uh, 
changes of an aorta, they, they, get, they get thin, they get bigger, they bulge, they tear, they rupture, they dissect. Um, the, the growth is, is variable. Generally, if you have a three centimeter aneurysm, it's gonna grow about a quarter centimeter a year. If it gets up to be about five centimeters, it's gonna grow about a half a centimeter a year. But having said that, we just don't know. If you have a saccular aneurysm, the risk is higher. Um, if you have a, a, an aneurysm that measures um, five centimeters in a little lady, that's more dangerous than a five centimeter aneurysm in myself. Um, so we have to take all of this into consideration. The law of Laplace says that, you know, the bigger it gets, the thinner it gets, the more pressure, the more likely it is uh, to rupture. Um, different morphologies, fusiform is circumferential, um, saccular is, it eventrates, it's, it's, it's not as symmetrical. Uh, sometimes the medial layer will dissect and you get a false lumen that will thrombose. And then if you get a pseudoaneurysm, that's usually from trauma or a suture line that is, that is uh, deteriorating. Uh, here are your risk factors. Um, males have, uh, they're, they're more likely to develop aneurysms. There's a high association with smoking and COPD, and that kind of makes sense. Um, if your tissue is bad in your lungs, your tissue is bad in your arteries. Um, and, and the one thing that, uh, one of the take home messages from my talk is that there is a significantly increased incidence with aneurysms in people that have had a previous cabbage and, and, and smoke. And so the prevalence is up to 19%. Um, and that's, that was kind of news to me when I went through this. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if your aneurysm gets up to seven centimeters, in five years, you have a 75% chance of rupture. Um, there's a lot of data out there, and there's a lot of numbers. And uh, it just makes sense, though, that the bigger they are, the more likely they are to rupture. Um, there's an old adage that 50% of the people don't make it to the hospital. The 50% that rupture, uh, they make it through the op uh, operation, and then 50% of those people make it through. Uh, like I said, I really don't think it's that, that bad anymore. Uh, and we're going to talk about our data at the hospital here in a little bit. Um, generally, if somebody has a symptomatic aneurysm, that artery is stretching. It, you get intermittent, vague abdominal pain or lower back pain. When it gets to the point where it's impending rupture or it ruptures, I mean, it is a constant, terrible throbbing pain. Um, and it depends on where it ruptures as to the degree of hemodynamic instability. So if you have an anterior rupture, those patients are going to go, they're going to go down fast. If you have a retroperitoneal rupture, it just depends on how well they tamponade uh, that rupture off and how long it takes for them to get to the hospital uh, as to determine how they're going to do. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, we, we have several options. If somebody has an aneurysm that is, um, you know, less than five and a half centimeters, it's just as a, as a, as a number, we, we wait. We wait till they're five and a half centimeters. Now, um, for years, five centimeters is kind of the mark, and, and you won't be faulted if you, if you say five centimeters is the mark. There's some literature that supports that. Um, but there are a lot of variables, like I talked about. If you have concomitant peripheral vascular disease, you have terrible, terrible iliac disease, you may want to go ahead and do an aortal bifemoral bypass and fix the aneurysm at the same time. Um, or you may want to, you know, stent. And while you're there stenting a big iliac aneurysm, you may want to go ahead and fix a very small abdominal aneurysm. Um, and so it's, it's not always easy to figure out how we're going to do it, but, but generally, if it's five and a half centimeters. Now, there, there was a season where a lot of doctors were fixing small aneurysms, and I was, I was fixing some smaller aneurysms for, for years, but the, the UK small aneurysm trial came out, and um, they, they, they talked about how, how patients did with intermediate size or small aneurysms because the risk of an endovascular treatment is a lot uh, lower than an open surgery. And, and they clearly stated that you need to wait till they're five and a half centimeters.
So open surgical repair, you get a laparotomy from your xiphoid process to your pubis symphysis. We go in there and we, we open up the aneurysm. We sew a, a tube graft or a bifurcated graft in there, lay over the aneurysm sac. Often you will see a CAT scan shortly after we do an open aneurysm repair and it will look like there's a ruptured aneurysm or contained rupture, but that's that aneurysm sac just laying over the artery. Endovascular repair, the first endovascular repair was in 1991. It was an Ancure device. At least the first commercially available device was in 1991. Um, we're just gonna move along. Generally, it's uh, not as risky to do an endovascular repair. They uh, have a shorter operative time, operative time. They stay the night and generally they go home the next day. Uh, open surgical repair takes two or three hours. Um, we have to wait for the bowels to wake up and they're generally in the hospital five to six days. Uh, endovascular repair for a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, Moore in 2007 uh, showed that if you developed an endovascular program for fixing a ruptured aneurysm, your mortality rate decreases um, and generally said that that mortality rate is 20%. And that's a lot less than fixing a ruptured aneurysm uh, via open means or the traditional way. So that really was a game changer. We started doing that in 2004 um, and have done several. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, there is a higher secondary intervention rate um, when we do endovascular repair. Uh, some of the big secondary complications include colon ischemia, uh, gluteal compartment syndrome, paraplegia, these are very, very uncommon, but they can't be overlooked. Um, if you were to ultrasound and screen these patients, you will find more aneurysms and therefore you will save more lives. <coughs> So this is our experience. Um, from 2006 to 2010, we did 16 ruptured aneurysms at the hospital. Um, eight of them we did open. Eight of them we fixed with a stent. There were two mortalities, which made a total mortality of 12.5%. The two mortalities were with open surgery. Um, from 2010 to 2015, we had 18 ruptured aneurysms. Nine of them were repaired open, and then nine with a stent. All four mortali uh, mortalities were uh, open surgery, and then the total uh, perioperative mortality was 22%. So what happens when somebody comes in, uh, we, we look at the patient, but we really try to, to get a CAT scan or see their CAT scan quickly and then determine if we, if we can stent them um, anatomically. And then we do have consigned stents uh, with multiple brand, uh, brands in stock of the hospital. So we will take in a patient from the ER, and we don't care if the OR is ready or not. We just take them and we run them up. And then we hand them off, anesthesia uh, takes them. A lot of times we will not even put them to sleep. We will, um, if, we, if we can fix them with a stent, we'll do a local cut down. Sometimes we'll put an aortic occlusion balloon, blow this up, and then put them to sleep. Um, and they will do better during induction. But uh, you, you, you have to have some experience and, and a protocol. And, uh, and so we've, we've been doing that for a little while now. So if, uh, if your patient enrolls in Medicare uh, for that first 10 years, uh, if they have had a history of smoking, then you can get a free ultrasound screening. Um, and I say free, but it's not really free. We're all paying for it, but they don't, it didn't charge the, the patient anything. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's saying everything that I just said. Um, so generally, if, if you have a small aneurysm, less than three centimeters, we, just, we already decided that's not an aneurysm, that's ectasia. So we don't, we don't necessarily have to follow them. Um, but if they get over three centimeters, they probably need an ultrasound once a year. We don't mind if you go ahead and refer the patient to us. We don't mind seeing them once a year because, like I've already previously said, these will grow. And so even though we don't fix them right away, eventually we probably will. Um, 
There is a, a, a website um, that is very helpful that you can give your patients, the AAA Aneurysm Outreach Program, and it's very, very good. Uh, real, real briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, aortic dissection. Uh, and, and specifically, I'm going to talk about a Stanford B dissection or a distal dissection of the descending thoracic aorta. Um, generally, at least historically in the past, this has been something that the, the heart guys and the chest guys have done, and, and they, they still do. And so if somebody comes in with a dissection, uh, the phone call is made to these guys, and then uh, they will more than likely treat them non-operatively. Um, the last, the last few years, there's been an abundance of literature that has suggested that these aneurysms will do better if you treat them with a stent. Um, what, when you treat them with a stent, what are your goals? Your goals are to cover the entry tear, so you get a flap. You, if you stop the, the inflow, you don't have to cover the entire dissection flap. Um, that will promote false lumen thrombosis and then induce aortic wall uh, remodeling. So um, this, these studies, uh, Ninabar in circulation 2013 had 140, 140 patients randomized that said uh, it was definitely better to treat with TVAR, endovascular, thoracic endovascular repair of the aneurysm versus optimal medical uh, therapy. Um, and 90%, 91% of them had false lumen thrombosis in, in follow-up. So that has really become the standard of care in the last few years. And then, so if we decide we're going to treat them, the next question is when we're going to treat them. And uh, that has also been answered recently. And generally, you just let everything settle down. You wait a few weeks. After everything settles down, you control their blood pressure. Their pain gets a little bit better. On an elective manner, you bring them back and you fix them, and those patients do a lot better. Thank you very much. Any questions for the panelists or myself? Don, that was a really good talk on uh, aneurysms. Um, I agree with you uh, regarding what you're saying about the size criteria, the five, five and a half, and that's what I practice, and that's what we all practice. But it does appear that when you look at the uh, UK small aneurysm trial or the ADAM trial, unfortunately there was a paucity of endoluminal repairs included in that trial, and there was a lot of crossover between the two arms, between the operative and the non-operative side. So basically, on the non-operative side, you had a bunch of patients that said, you know, I want an operation. I don't want this thing to rupture. Mm -hmm. So they crossed over to the surgical side. So then, that's a real confounding factor in that trial and in the American equivalent. So really, that makes one think that perhaps we should be fixing them at a smaller level. We've no definite proof for that, but I would imagine that may be borne out. The other major issue with aneurysms is the endovascular treatment. It's a, it's a great treatment, and it was borne out by the uh, EVAR-1 and the DREAM-1 trials uh, that came out around 98. Uh, they sh definitely showed there was a reduced morbidity and mortality in the first 30 days, and they followed them at two years for the EVAR trial, four years for the DREAM, and the mortality and morbidity was reduced. But their subsequent follow-up trials, EVAR-2 and DREAM-2 trials, have shown no difference in morbidity and mortality between open repair and endovascular repair. And then when you take into account the cost of endovascular repair and now the uh, impetus towards reducing medical costs, I think that's going to become uh, very uh, interesting in the years ahead as to whether or not we'll be constrained with the number of grafts we put in for treating these aneurysms. But, I mean, overall, I, I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you on the size, and I agree with you that endovascular repair is better than open if we can do it. But I think that the ground is shifting on us. And I wonder if our autonomy is going to uh, be, um, you know, changing somewhat, you know, as to whether, what, what uh, therapeutic modalities we're going to be allowed to use. So the question was, how do I manage a 4.6 centimeter aneurysm? Infrarenal. Infrarenal, abdominal aortic aneurysm. 
with mural thrombus? So, okay. So generally, that's with the absence of confounding issues. So if you just have somebody who's asymptomatic, we're, all ta we're talking about asymptomatic here. If somebody has a 4.6 centimeter aneurysm and they have abdominal pain and they're tender, then I'm more than likely going to fix them. Um, now, 4.4, 4.3, I'm not. Um, I'm going to control their blood pressure and watch them very closely. 4.6, and they're asymptomatic, I'm going to watch them do surveillance. What about you, Dr. O'Keefe? I agree. Uh, I think it's highly unusual uh, for an aneurysm of four point something centimeters to be symptomatic. It's almost reportable. Um, I think I've uh, maybe seen one in 10 years, um, but they do occur. And certainly there's also the confounding factor of maybe an inflammatory aneurysm as well. And then you can make an argument as to whether you should intervene in an inflammatory aneurysm at a smaller size uh, at a smaller size criteria than you would a regular aneurysm, but I agree with you. If I think that you can't, you can't take a chance. Uh, I think whilst I think that a four to four five centimeter aneurysm is unlikely to be symptomatic, having pain, if they are having abdominal pain, I think you'd be a fool not to fix it, because if they did rupture, then you're in real trouble. Because pain in the abdomen with any sort of an aneurysm is a sign of impending rupture. So my practice would be the exact same as yours there, especially in women. Patients with connective tissue disease, again, similar story, like Lewitt's diets, or you would fix them, you'll have a lower threshold of fixing their aneurysms? No, or not really? no, with the connective tissue disease, I would uh, adhere to the five, five and a half centimeter criteria. There's no indication in the literature that they're more, at least in the, uh, in the realm of abdominal aortic aneurysm, there's no indication to indicate that they would rupt, more likely to rupture than a regular common garden aneurysm. I have a quick question for Dr. Brown. Sure. Uh, could you comment briefly on how you manage your patients postoperatively? Uh, how do you follow them on CAT scans or MRAs once you've repaired uh, their triple A's, say, endovascularly? Yeah, so, so I tell my patients <clears throat> that you are married to me for a while. Um, and so even though we're fixing the aneurysm, they still require uh, CAT scan surveillance. So I will get a CAT scan about six, four to six weeks after I repair it to make sure everything looks good, and then yearly thereafter. Now, after four, five, six years, if it looks the same and the aneurysm doesn't have a, an endoleak, and we didn't get into endoleaks here, but um, and if it looks good, then I will discharge that. But uh, otherwise, uh, the plan is to follow them yearly. Thank you all.